8 o'clock on Friday evening in front of the terminal bar. The traffic is heavy. Theater goers and cabs that are inching their way uptown stare at the stream of hustlers who have very little to sell. The air is alive. It is Friday, and this is the Avenue. Sprawled in front of the bar are two bodies, white drunks who didn't make it to their single-room occupancy hotels in time. Inside, the assorted wrecks nod their heads to the music and some try little steps to the disco beat. Two blocks of blasting smoke. If you cut it with a knife, <laughs> you know, smoky, cheap fucking cologne. You know that. What an odor. The first thing that hits you when you walk through the door was the men's room. The odor from the men's room was the first fucking thing. You know, sometimes they would shit in the urinals that night. Mm -hmm. They do it through the door in the day. And Coochie had to go in there and clean that out. Nice. <laughs> I said, Coochie, this is your payback. It could be worse. At least you can go home at night. 427 is Bobby. He was a porter at the bar. Originally, he was a short order cook. He looked good. He looks good here. You should still saw him at the end. I think he was like the, one of the forerunners with AIDS. They never could diagnose it. He was in, the house, in and out of the hospital. I don't know how many times. He was always yellow. The porter at the bar, he, he'd be the first one in there in the morning. He'd clean up, clean the urinals, sweep the place, mop the place, bring the beer up, stack all the beer. That's what a porter is, and that's what Coochie was doing for a while. Number 27 didn't make it for the day. At the end, the alcohol stripped him of everything, that he was shitting in his pants and he couldn't control his bowels anymore. That was a sad thing. That was sad. He worked a few months, he was there, no problem. He was the porter. So your grandfather wanted to send him to the bank. He said, boy, what are you sending him to the bank for? Never saw him again. Two operations have left Murray Goldman's face splotchy. And it's as if his blood has chosen to surface only in special places. He is a fashion coordinator's dream. Maroon suede jacket, maroon trousers, pink shirt, all topped with straight white hair. Every Friday he used to go for his dues, to go in and get his little hair cut, his nails done, and spoof his head and give him a poof. Come back from there, you know, have about seven, eight inches of this gray stuff, <laughs> like snow. I got a picture of that too, <laughs> every Friday. I've been in this business for 22 and a half years, he says. I'd run one of the toughest bars in town. The element here is supposed to be the worst in the city. Nothing but crooks, hooers, pimps, and punks. But they all toe the line in here. This is Mikey, he was a bouncer at the bar. He was like six foot four. And he knew all that karate stuff. He's the one who broke one of my pictures by accident. That was hanging so high up, I can't imagine how he reached it. Roy, I remember that name. Roy, why? I don't know why. That's, he used to be a bartender. He died while I was working at the bar. He was a guy, nice guy. He was from the old school. He lived on our block. He lived on 11th Street, only a little near Hudson. He was an old customer. I don't know where he was earlier when I came on the scene, and then he showed up later on one. And then he became a bartender. He was one of the bartenders. Warm Mix was gay. He could deal with all that shit. He had to be special to deal with all that crap. Miss Dennis, he was a bartender, and he was, uh, he was a good guy. He was diabetic. 
and his toes were rotting away. So he had his toes removed. His first stop back from the hospital was the terminal bar. 1324, that's Rick Hay, our bartender, our famous bartender. Gay. Tough guy, went to jail. Did time for something, I don't know why. His son used to come in the bar. Yeah, I have sons. Gay people have sons and everything. I have a son. This guy, uh, he wound up working in the bar, the bouncer and then the bartender. He was pretty straight. He thought he knew what he was doing. And I told him, I said, you're going to hang out around here. The corner's going to get you. And near the end, he was a junkie. 6 was a bartender. He couldn't make it. He couldn't make that scene. You know, you gotta be a special person to make that scene there, especially at night. It's just a tough gig. It is a tough job. Especially if you know that there's nothing else but this is it. I mean, this is it. Most of the bartenders you see here, they all were night shift bartenders. Dennis worked with me on the weekends, on Saturdays, or Roy worked with me on Saturdays. Pat DeSantis, he was a real winner, real nice guy. He was, from the beginning, he was there until the end. He was gay, he was an alcoholic. I got a picture of him here, of him sleeping on the floor in the bar. The big diamond shape, Kyle, and he's sleeping in the fetal position. Irving got a heart attack in the bar, survived it to come back, but he was there in the middle part of my years there, which was good, he was dependable, because he relieved me. And Irving was Jewish and on time. And that was important because some of them other bartenders, you know what I mean? I have him in full dress somewhere, right there. I think I have him. I want took a picture of him for posterity, and I would, cause he dressed like I dressed. I went to when I wore the apron, the long apron. Always, I never shortened him with the all the faggots and jersey. They made these blue aprons. They didn't want to be. I'm not a bartender. I'm a macho man, so they took right. their and they made a little. It's a whole psychology, you know. I study, you gotta study everything. If you're there, you might as well get all the clues. If you're there, there's a reason you're there.